the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. On today's program, you will hear stories from John Russell and Katie Weaver. Then Dan Novak presents this week's education report. Finally, John Russell returns to present today's lesson of the day. But first, here is this report from Katie Weaver. Charlotte has spent much of her life in captivity. At a nonprofit aquarium in North Carolina's Appalachian Mountains, she is an ocean animal called a round stingray. She is about three thousand seven hundred kilometers from her natural habitat in the Pacific Ocean, off Southern California, and she has not shared space. With a male of her species, in at least eight years. But Charlotte is about to give birth. The reddish-brown stingray is pregnant with as many as four young, called pups. They were created by a rare process of natural reproduction called parthenogenesis. A female animal develops an egg into an embryo, without fertilization material from a male. Charlotte will give birth to her young at home. Team Echo Aquarium and Shark Lab on Main Street in Hendersonville. Brenda Raymer formed the organization and serves as its chief. She said, "When caretakers first noticed a lump on Charlotte's back, they thought it might be a cancerous growth. So they examined the animal with an ultrasound machine, which makes images using sound. The images showed that Charlotte was pregnant. The aquarium team was shocked." We were all like, "Shut the back door! There's no way," Raymer said. We thought we were overfeeding her, but we were overfeeding her because she has more mouths to feed. The small aquarium encourages local school children and others to take an interest in science. Now they are getting a real life lesson. Few witness. Parthenogenesis can happen in some insects, fish, amphibians, birds, and reptiles, but it is extremely unusual. Documented examples have included California condors, Komodo dragons, and yellow-bellied water snakes. Katie Lyons is a research scientist at the Georgia Aquarium in Atlanta. She is not connected to the North Carolina Aquarium. She said Charlotte's pregnancy is the only documented example of parthenogenesis in the round stingray that she knows of. But Lyons is not shocked. Other kinds of rays and related fish, such as sharks, have had these kinds of pregnancies under human care. I'm not surprised because nature finds a way of having this happen," she said. To be clear, Lyons said, "These animals are not cloning themselves." Instead, a female's egg joins with another cell in the female. This leads to cell division and creation of an embryo. We don't know why it happens, 
Lyons said, just that it's kind of this really neat phenomenon that they seem to be able to do. Charlotte lives in a tank of about 8,300 liters of water. Raymer said the aquarium is hoping to get a tank nearly twice that size for Charlotte's young. They also want to put live cameras up for people to see them. It is very rare to happen, Raymer said, but it's happening in the middle of the Blue Ridge Mountains in rural North Carolina, hundreds of miles from the ocean. Round stingrays like Charlotte are common along the Pacific Ocean coasts of Southern California and Mexico. They often rest on the ocean's sandy bottom near land. In the wild, they are about the size of a food plate. They come in all shades of brown. They eat small animals like worms, crabs, and mollusks. And round stingrays are sometimes eaten by sharks, seals, and giant sea bass. The round stingray is well known to humans who like to go in the ocean. The ray can sting when stepped on. Lyons finds the species fascinating. I'm glad the round stingray is getting the media attention that it deserves, Lyons said. It's not necessarily as sexy as a white shark, but they do a lot of really neat stuff. I'm Katie Weaver. The maker of ChatGPT recently announced its next move into generative artificial intelligence. San Francisco-based OpenAI's new text-to-video generator, called Sora, is a tool that instantly makes short videos based on written commands, called prompts. Sora is not the first of its kind. Google, Meta, and Runway ML are among the other companies to have developed similar technology. But the high quality of videos displayed by OpenAI, some after CEO Sam Altman asked social media users to send in ideas for written prompts, surprised observers. At the same time, the video results led to fears about the possible ethical and societal effects. A photographer from New Hampshire posted one suggestion, or prompt, on X. The prompt gave details about a kind of food to be cooked, gnocchi, as well as the setting, an old Italian country kitchen. The prompt said, a instructional cooking session for homemade gnocchi hosted by a grandmother social media influencer set in a rustic Tuscan country kitchen with cinematic lighting. Altman answered a short time later with a realistic video that showed what the prompt described. The tool is not yet publicly available. OpenAI has given limited information about how it was built. The company also has not stated what imagery and video sources were used to train Sora. The New York Times and some writers have taken legal actions against OpenAI for its use of copyrighted works of writing to train ChatGPT. 
and OpenAI pays a fee to the Associated Press, the source of this report, to license its text news archive. OpenAI said in a blog post that it is communicating with artists, policymakers, and others before releasing the new tool to the public. The company added that it is working with red teamers, people who try to find problems and give helpful suggestions to develop Sora. We are working with red teamers, experts in areas like misinformation, hateful content, and bias, who will be adversarially testing the model, the company said. We're also building tools to help detect misleading content, such as a detection classifier that can tell when a video was generated by Sora. I'm John Russell. When Clarissa Haglid completed culinary school at the Delaware Food Bank last summer, it was the first time she had graduated from anything in her life. Just a few years earlier, a goal like that did not seem within reach. In 2020, she was charged with armed robbery and later sentenced to prison. Haglid told VOA that she lost everything, including the custody of her children. As she approached the end of her four-year prison sentence, she learned about a restaurant service training program available to people in jail. Haglid started attending culinary school classes at the food bank in Newark, Delaware, when she received permission to take part in the work release program. Through the 14-week program, students learned cooking and life skills to prepare them for a job in the restaurant or hospitality industry. Some of the students currently at Newark were incarcerated like Haglid. Others are in substance abuse recovery programs or underemployed, meaning they have been out of the workforce for a long time, said Anna McDermott. She is the food bank's chief impact officer. Haglid and other students learned how to use knives in cooking, correct food preparation, and how to make the five foundational mother sauces and other skills. The program also teaches teamwork, work ethic, and time management. Those kinds of life skills, also called soft skills, are taught to make sure that folks are really familiar with what is expected of them in the workplace to maintain employment, McDermott said. Getting a job is the easiest part sometimes. It's maintaining that job. At the end of the program, students are provided an entry-level job through the State Restaurant Association. Haglid is an apprentice at a nearby hotel where she receives a paycheck and additional training as a cook. This program meant everything to me because it was a way for me to get not my life back, but a life to begin with, Haglid said. Attending the culinary school started to bridge the gap of restoration between me and my kids. Haglid was able to attend the classes through a U.S. Department of Labor program called HOPES, Hospitality Opportunities for People Re-Entering Society. HOPES is operated through the National Restaurant Association Education Foundation, or the NRAEF, an industry group, which partners with community organizations like the Delaware Food Bank. The group's goal with HOPES is to get incarcerated people training and jobs in the restaurant industry. 
Rob Gifford is president of the NRAEF. He said restaurant jobs help prevent recidivism, the word for returning to prison. Gifford said food service jobs help people released from prison get work and a way to earn money as soon as possible. Food service, he said, has a relatively low barrier to entry compared to other jobs that might require more training. Since prisons provide food service, there is already a place to provide training. And unlike other work, restaurant jobs often do not require college or even high school degrees. We're allowing these individuals to get on their feet quickly via the restaurant industry, but we're giving them transferable skills, Gifford said. When they decide they're ready to move on to their next opportunity, they're positioned for success. Employment for formerly imprisoned people is very important to prevent recidivism. The NRAEF says that formerly imprisoned people who maintained a job for the first year following their release had a 16% recidivism rate over three years. That is compared to a 52% recidivism rate for those that did not maintain employment. The unemployment rate for people formerly incarcerated is more than six times the national rate. Gifford said about 1,000 people have gone through the HOPES program nationwide, and two-thirds are currently employed. Haglid, who said she is regaining custody of her children, plans to continue her work in restaurants and one day lead a kitchen as a chef. She also said she wants to support the educational and job training programs that helped her find work. She said the programs are needed to prevent recidivism and provide hope for the future. When you realize you have the ability to learn, it almost creates a hunger in you where you want to absorb as much as you possibly can, Haglid said. You begin to have a drive that you never had before. I'm Dan Novak. Novak joins me now to talk more about his education story. Hi, Dan. Hi, Ashley. In the story, you note that the culinary school at the Delaware Food Bank teaches soft skills as a part of its curriculum. Can you explain the difference between hard skills and soft skills? Yes, so hard skills are what we say to refer to the technical skills required for a job. So in restaurants, those hard skills would be knowing how to use a knife, how to prepare certain foods or mix ingredients. Soft skills are life skills that help in a professional setting. Things like teamwork, being on time, or a good work ethic. And those are skills important for any job. The culinary school program teaches people who are underemployed and those who are in prison. Getting a job is very important to staying out of prison. Is that correct? Yes, it's incredibly important. Recidivism rates are very high in the U.S. About 70% of people released from prison will again commit crimes within five years. But recidivism rates greatly drop when people can maintain employment. People who maintained a job for the first year following their release had a 16% recidivism rate over three years. And restaurant jobs seem especially well-suited for those coming out of prison. Yeah, there's a couple reasons for that. One, jobs in food service don't require as much training as other jobs might. So, once you're released from prison, if you have that bit of restaurant training, you can quickly get a job. Also, high school degrees are not always required. Prisons also have a food service component, so there's already a place for people to be trained while in prison. Not only is getting a job important, It's getting a job as quickly as possible after release. 
Well, thanks so much for answering my questions, Dan. And thanks for that report. You're welcome. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. report, we explore some recent news about a large kind of American butterfly, the monarch butterfly. We learn that the monarch butterfly population has dropped to one of its lowest numbers on record in the place where the creatures spend the winter, forests in Mexico. Pay careful attention to the word migration. We will talk more about it after the report. The monarch butterfly population has dropped to its second lowest number on record in Mexican forests this winter. The forests are the insects' winter home. The population decrease is worrisome as the butterfly group is already considered at risk of disappearance. Mexico's government and the non-profit World Wildlife Fund, WWF, recently issued findings of their yearly joint study on the butterflies. The research shows that the monarch butterfly presence has shrunk to less than a hectare of forest area. In the mid-1990s, Monarch butterflies could be found on around 18 hectares of the forest. The findings represent an almost 60% decrease in the monarch butterfly population compared to last year's study. It is also the second lowest population finding since the first study took place more than 30 years ago. Biologists blame the drop on higher-than-usual temperatures and dry conditions in the northwestern U.S., where the butterfly reproduces. The weather conditions affect the growth of milkweed, the plant where the butterflies lay their eggs. When the young arrive, milkweed is their food for a time. In one of the planet's famous wildlife migrations, the butterflies travel south as many as 4,500 kilometers from places as far north as Canada. They spend the winter in warmer Mexico, where millions of the insects stay in trees that protect them from the rain and cold. Monarch butterfly populations change year to year. As recently as 2021, the same study showed a 35% increase to cover around 2.8 hectares. Officials and activists called for more action to help the species. Such calls include the need to reduce threats posed by herbicides that destroy milkweed and the need to protect forests. We can't lower our guard, Jorge Rickards, head of WWF's Mexico office, told reporters after releasing the latest data. I'm John Russell. Before the report, we asked you to pay careful attention to the word migration. Can you remember when you heard it? You heard the term used to describe the movements of large numbers of the butterflies. Let's listen again. 
In one of the planet's famous wildlife migrations, the butterflies travel south as many as 4,500 kilometers from places as far north as Canada. They spend the winter in warmer Mexico, where millions of the insects stay in trees that protect them from the rain and cold. Migration is a noun. We spell it like this. M-I-G-R-A-T-I-O-N It is related to the verb form migrate. We spell migrate like this. M-I-G-R-A-T-E Migration, the noun, and migrate, the verb, generally suggest the idea of moving from one place to another place. When we talk about birds or animals specifically, migration and migrate suggest movement from one area to another area at different times of the year. There is generally a connection with the seasons of the year. That is why the report says that the butterflies spend the winter in warmer Mexico. How might we use migrate and migration to summarize what we have heard in this report? If we were to use the verb form migrate, we could say that the monarch butterflies migrate south to spend the winter in a warmer climate. If we were to use the noun form migration, we could say that the monarch butterfly migration is one of the most famous wildlife migrations in the world. We use the term migration to describe all kinds of large movements of animals, bird migrations, whale migrations, caribou migrations, and so on. So, the next time you read about animals, or watch a show about the natural world, pay careful attention to the word migration. You can ask yourself questions like, why do the animals migrate at that time of year? Or, what is the purpose of their migration? Asking these kinds of questions can help you practice using language that you have learned. You will also develop your appreciation of the natural world, its complexity, its richness, and its wonder. And that's the lesson of the day. I'm John Russell. our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak.